Welcome, welcome one and all to the second session of the RWD School of Rock. Last time, as you recall, we went over kind of some of the design basics. Today, I want to get a little more into the nitty gritty of how design translates into development. Because I know as developers, we kind of, we dabble in a little bit of Photoshop. We have an understanding of where your design, how your design tools work. And we want to kind of share a knowledge of how our development tools work at a basic level just so you get an understanding of how the design goes into code, because that can really help when you're building your designs to get an idea of how they will be translated, what things are feasible, what things may not necessarily be feasible. And again, starting off, designers don't need to be developers, but it never hurts to have just kind of that baseline understanding. Uh, when you're looking at a design, you're looking at a PSD, and you've kind of got layers which can kind of sit anywhere, you can move them up and down in the stack. You can move the actual image all around anywhere on the page. With development, we don't have as much of that freedom. Uh, PSDs have layers. HTML is structured with the DOM, not to be confused with the DON. So just to be clear, this is the DON. This is the DOM. The DON is scary. The DOM is awesome. <laughs> They're both cool. But regardless. So the DOM is the document object model. When, we, when a developer looks at a website, we see basically text. It's all text. It's basically a story of the website written in a different language, in the markup language, the HTML. So from a structural standpoint, a site has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It has the header, it has the main content, and it has the footer. And we, once it's in that structure, once it's in that document structure, we can't decide to kind of change that story when the screen size changes. We can't say all of a sudden take the header and then move it in the document under you know, another piece of content. We might be able to do some stuff with positioning and styling, but at the core, the structure of that document has to stay in order. You always have to follow that story order regardless of what kind of screen size you're looking at, what kind of device you're looking at. Yeah, that's th th also important to keep in mind that that's how Google's and, and uh, Google's, uh, how, how search engines and, and screen readers also view the pages. They view them as documents. <clears throat> so, yeah, and we'll actually, I'm going to touch in a little bit more today on screen readers and actually give you guys a demo of how a website is read by a screen reader in case you've never played around with it before. And again, focusing on the DOM and on kind of the story of the website ties right back into the ideas we're pushing of content strategy and content first. Because if you go in knowing, you know, this is the most important content, this is the next most important, this is kind of secondary and can sit on the side and be lower in importance, then you guys know how to lay out your pages best, and then we can translate those into a document, into a website that follows that story and gives the proper content order. It gets kind of confusing when you aren't sure, well, I don't know really what's most important, what least important. It makes it hard to tell that story. And so just to give you an example, that's not what I wanted. There we go. So this is the Nissan site. And I spent most of the time while developing that site looking at something like this. So see here is the kind of story of Nissan. We have the navigation, the primary and the secondary navigation, which are sitting up here. We have, then we go down, you know, here's our main content. Here's our main content. So you see it kind of translates from the design, the way it looks, back into the actual code and the way it sits in the story. Can you bring up the dev tools so we can highlight? And oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, so let's go through. Appealing. Yes. <laughs> Pop that side by side. All right. So you see here, this is how I browse the internet most days. Um, yeah, so see, here's the beginning. You know, this is the header, the start. This, the body is the whole document, so the header is the start. And then we go through, we have the different portions of the header. Your utility navigation, the main navigation, and then you know, the wrapper, which contains the content. It also contains the sidebar stuff, which is down here. Developers spend a lot of their time, uh, especially front-end developers, uh, trying to ensure that the documents that we do get out onto the web are semantically sound, meaning we want them to make sense uh, without all of the visuals. So we want them to make sense to Google and then screen readers. So we spend a lot of our time uh, trying to uh, make that happen. <laughs> you know? 
We throw wild parties. As soon as you look at the document, it's, it should make sense. You know? so, yeah, and you know, having so structure is very, very important. Yeah. yeah, having a general idea of that structure can then help you guys back in your designs to see. Okay, so this is kind of the main. You know, this is the main article section. This is the sidebar section to get kind of those common terminologies flowing between both sides. Now, when we talk about the document, I know as developers, we see it all in order, but that doesn't necessarily mean when something is on a smaller screen that everything just has to stack. Because I've heard, you know, lately with responsive sense, sometimes they get into, okay, we're just gonna take everything and shrink it and stack it. And that's responsive. And it is in a sense, but there's so much more you can do. And that's where a lot of the really awesome creative potential with responsive design comes in is in different kind of interaction design and different ways you can handle the way user interacts with content when it's a more limited screen space. So adding helpers for easier navigation on mobile, things like if we actually shrink down this page, you know, mobile menu buttons, which I'm going to go through some nav patterns, uh, back to top links, which make things easier to navigate. Completely losing my place in the presentation. Um, yeah, and then things like expandable sections, which you can choose to use only on a smaller screen version or also on a larger screen version. So something like here, there's a lot of deep content. This goes through, it has several layers. And we actually chose both on the smaller screen version and on the larger screen version to have it be expandable just because there was so much content. But maybe it's something where you have a couple paragraphs and on mobile, it would be a nicer presentation to just have them fold up and have the user open them as they go down and read. But on desktop, maybe those are all just all expanded and you don't have, you know, the pluses and minuses. But those are different types of things you can start to consider. So it isn't just, all right, take it and stack it and we're done. There's a lot to play around with and that's what makes it kind of fun. And I mentioned this last time, I'm going to say it again. The fold isn't a thing. So don't worry about when you're doing a responsive design, making sure that, you know, okay, we're going to collapse everything into like 20 expandable sections that are going to sit all next to each other so that the user will be able to see every single little bit of content when they look, get on that homepage. It's okay. Use, you know, you're used to picking up your phone, scrolling up and down, looking at things. So you don't necessarily have to cram every piece of content into the top of the page. It, it, it naturally makes sense to put your most important content at the top of the page, you know, uh, even in that. Yeah. Well, no, I have a question about that. Yeah. yeah. Not a question, a question, but more about, we just went through this with the site that we were developing. And I agree, the fold, you shouldn't be so concerned about the fold. But um, on one of these landing pages that we were creating, there's a picture of a, human, of a person on the right bottom corner. Right. And when we looked at it at like tablet or desktop, the person's head was landing roughly around that, that fold area. So you're getting like this kind of, you've seen a whole page, you've seen the top of the person's head. Right. So. We had to reposition that person further up to make sure that they stayed, they stayed clear of that fold area, okay. it, it, it went in, so it wasn't unnatural. You still have to be careful there because there are so many devices out on the market now. Yeah. You could potentially run into that same issue again on a device that might be a little bit smaller. Yeah. You know, you never, you're never going to be able to tackle it 100%. Well, I guess it goes to what you just said, though. That person was important, so we need to make sure we move the important content. Okay. Time. Yeah. yeah. So as long as you're mindful of, of all the different devices that yeah. are out there and the possibility that you could run into that issue again, yeah. you, know, you just have to be wary. Sure. There, you know. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. And that's also something where perhaps if you got down to a really small screen, you may even just want to either move the person to just kind of static or just remove it entirely. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so then you don't have to worry about that sort of issues because if it's a choice between seeing a slightly beheaded person or not seeing a person at all, I think one user experience is a little better than the other. But yeah, thank you for bringing that up because that I know I've seen a couple of designs where they have that sort of imagery. And then going on the idea of trying to cram everything to the top, carousels. Try to use them sparingly. And does everyone know what a carousel is? Uh, okay, um, Nissan on the home page, home. This is a carousel. It's, uh, I guess, a slider is another thing where you, you're able, sometimes they have arrows, so you can toggle through, sometimes you can use the keys, and it's just, you know, a bunch of things, and you, the user has to click through, or sometimes it goes through automatically to see all of the different content. The issue with carousels, while they can be great at kind of saving you vertical space, if that's a major concern, 
users don't always interact with them a lot. And there are a growing number, a growing body of statistics to support the fact that as you go deeper into the carousel content, click through drops down dramatically. We actually got some, uh, Ted forwarded me some statistics this morning on the number of times a certain image, certain images in a carousel that was on the Walmart site were, you know, pinged from our server, like how many times they were downloaded. And between the first one and the fifth one, I think the first one had twice as many hits as the fifth one. So just to give you an idea of how many people are just not getting to that other content. So if you have important content, it, you don't want to hide it in a carousel. To speak to that point, someone has actually gone so far as to use a carousel to explain why you should not use carousels. Uh, this is a statistic from a different study, and the links, oh, yeah, I had this problem yesterday. This thing kind of auto-scrolls, which I think is supposed to highlight the point that these can be incredibly frustrating. <laughs> but uh, these links I'll go to uh, deeper statistics if you want to read more. But this is saying only 1% of people in this test clicked a feature on the carousel at all. And of the 1% who even interacted, stop that, 89% clicked the first one. So that means of all of the people who are testing that site feature, very few actually clicked on any of the deeper content. So if you're using a carousel to be quote unquote engaging, that's not necessarily engaging people with your content because this just clicking back and forth isn't necessarily engaging if people aren't actually clicking through the links. So if you're thinking about mobile, is there a corollary or is there, is there, is there a recommendation that you would make rather it depends. See, that's the thing. It depends. It depends on the content. And that's why we're dealing with content focused design. There's no one rule with any of this design that, you know, oh, in this situation, you use X or in this situation, you use Y. You just really have to look at the content and see what kind of structure, what's the best way that a user can get at this. And obviously, this something psychotic like, scrolling like thing a, is not. Something like an image carousel might make sense. But, you know, if you go sticking in your content, be, you know, doing a huge disservice to, uh, yes, you know, so. the, the, the end user experience because they might not be able to access it. So you just, you know, maybe instead of thinking about cramming everything to a carousel, we're thinking about different layout approaches to our content instead of taking the easy route and, and, and sticking something into a carousel. You right. know, just right. giving it a little bit more thought than we than we would normally do. I, I, I mean, we understand, you know, clients like carousels and they're it's sexy and all that. Yeah. And yeah, and it's novel and, and, and everything, but you know, sometimes it's not always the answer. So we just have to be mindful of stuff like that, you know? Yeah. And in general, you know, if a client is, re and again, we say this all the time, if a client is really pushing, dying for something and won't budge, Let then go, yeah. you put it in, I, you know, yeah, you, but, <laughs> but regardless, I really want, and you know, as developers, we do it as designers. I'd really like you guys as well to give a little more pushback and just say, you know, this may not be the best way to present your content. If you, you know, users may not be able to access this as easily. Just start throwing those flags, if nothing else. So people can start hearing it more. That kind of thought can start circulating, you know, among clients, among the account teams. Because I know, you know, Spell and I basically talk ourselves blue saying it all day. But it's good to start having these conversations more generally to get the information out there. A couple notes on that. Um, first of all, I've never seen a seven or eight page carousel like that. That's, that's a little realistic, but um, it's usually a three or four when they're gray. I mean, roughly. Uh, I mean, I just saw mock for Boeing that had 10, so. Yeah, well, that's crazy. <laughs> but um, I think what happens is when it comes to you know our industry, employer brands, websites, mm -hmm. they usually do have two or three or four important messages they want to get across. Mm -hmm. So I, the ones that I design, I don't make it so that they have to click through. It's usually automated so that they are sitting on the site for more than 10 seconds. They'll be exposed to those top three messages. Mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Because the thing is, if you don't show it up, so when you do employee brand development, you usually have these pillars where you have three or four things from a diversity to uh, work-life balance to leadership, whatever they, they feel that they mm -hmm. want to communicate. Mm -hmm. And if you, it's hard to communicate that all in one image or one message, if you will, in one up, up top. So I think the carousel from a two or three frame perspective is something that is useful when you're trying to communicate a client's employer brand, as opposed to saying putting one up top and then burying the ones below, and they might not ever get to that as well. Mm -hmm. So I would like to ask, if you don't use carousel, what is another way of potentially communicating three important messages on a career site that the client is saying, you know, you can't favor one over the other? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think yeah. I understand what you're saying. 
Yeah, it gets rough when you're dealing with something where they're giving content priority to three. You know, we're asking it's for one, way, and they're giving saying, us oh, three. Yeah. Group will develop, yeah. They'll say, they'll say your company is based on these four pillars. This is what's going to differentiate you in the marketplace against your competitors. Mm -hmm. So all four of them are just as equally important. Mm -hmm. and when you develop that, you have to communicate that some way. It's hard to get all four things in one headline. It's all, it's impossible actually. Right. That's why there usually is some type of rotating thing to say. Look, at our company, you have a voice. At our company, you can uh, have work-life balance. At our company, and that granted, I'm not going to go through eight things. Yeah. But they usually define the top three. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So in that case, if we don't use a carousel, what is another potential way, maybe from a programming standpoint, that we can utilize to kind of communicate three equally important messages? Is there something? I don't. I don't know if there is off the top of my head. Uh, yeah, it's. I have to give that some that's thought. A challenge. I'm yeah, saying, it's no, I'm, no. I don't think we gratuitously put stuff in a carousel. It's usually mm -hmm. because. We've been tasked with that problem. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think yeah. that's something we need to think more yeah. broadly about because, you know, we're using the carousel and it solves, I guess, the space issue. Yeah. But if we're seeing that people aren't necessarily looking yeah. at all that content, it isn't really solving the initial problem, which it's kind of a solution, but it isn't solving My the initial problem. Out there for 15 seconds. <laughs> and people, five, 15 seconds when they're looking around where they want to navigate, they're being exposed to three images. Right. That's the goal. Yeah. The, the way I'm thinking about it. I'm not hoping that they click on that. Right. I'm hoping that just, it rotates on its own before they start figuring out where to work. By the time they figure out where the current options are, you know, that's a, they'll, they'll be exposed to three messages. Mm -hmm. that's the yeah, message. but it, yeah. you know, I, it's, it's hard because you want them to read the messages, but you also in the end want the user to be able to know right away. You know, you don't want them, in a way you want them to see the messages, but you don't want them to be sitting forever trying to figure out how to actually use your site. Because in the end, the point of the site is for them to find jobs. Yeah. You want them... You know, from yeah. I guess from my standpoint, thinking outside of client branding or that, I want a user to be able to find jobs as fast as possible. Yeah. And it's it's definitely it's a dilemma. Part of the dilemma might be going. There's no one answer that I'm going to give you today. Like, oh, well, you obviously do this yeah. for a time. You know, carousels might be the way to go for some of these messages, but we have to make sure a they aren't too heavily overloaded. I guess yeah. you know, one or two small messages. That was the other mm -hmm. the other Walmart statistic <laughs> from today was. There were four images in a carousel, and the images were so large that they almost, I want to say they added about 50% to our entire static network traffic coming in, and we're going to cost us an extra like $4,000 a year. $4,000 a year <laughs> just to host those four images every time they were getting hit bandwidth on that cost. carousel. And then not to mention the uh, bandwidth costs that we're passing over to the end users on, on mobile, too, by loading in those huge oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting raped by Verizon, so is that one. Is there an average amount of time people spend on a homepage? Uh, the question was, is there an average amount of time people spend on a homepage? The answer is there is probably a statistic for that. I don't have it readily available. We can find out, probably. I know that people will leave your site very, very quickly if it's not efficient and if it's not optimized to load quickly, especially on mobile. Uh, you know, I, I think the statistic is like, Something like possibly one second. You know, if your site doesn't load within like a second, maybe two seconds, you're out of there. I think for every set, there's a certain percentage for every second longer it takes to load. That's how many percent of people just keep dropping off. Yeah. So that's that's another thing you have to balance is if you're using carousels for like messaging for text, that's a little easier because it's not as heavy on the browser. But if you're using it for huge images, that sort of thing then we're getting into optimization issues as well. Right. So the takeaway here essentially is just, and we can certainly sit down and butt heads and work out some sort of solution for the carousel, but just be wary, you know, just be careful, you know, yeah. and just take this knowledge with you, uh, with and, with you and share it. With part of it clients. might even go back to the content strategy in the beginning, and it might be something we have to revisit more broadly is, do they need three different messages, or is there a way we can create one more kind of overarching condensed message? You know, one of the ways we dealt with the new sound I think it was probably implicit that we had those messages there in the carousel was to try yeah. to build them into the, uh, the, the, you know, the other pages, whether it was like a Nissan or, you know, me or people, that you could carry some of those same uh, you know, pillar-type messages over to those those pages so that, that they would get them there, too. But that's, that's a per Nissan's a perfect example. Yeah. It's a global team mm -hmm. the overarching message. But you could keep going. They wanted to communicate that strength as part of their offering. Right, strength. Both integration and innovation. Yeah. And those are all, you know, obviously making parallels to their their product, but also mm -hmm. to their their um, 
point one. Yeah. yeah. They're not hierarchical necessarily besides the, the global team. That's that's dominant, right? But mm -hmm. the, the four after that, they pretty much take an equal uh, staff footing in terms of which would you like the employee to get to get, get the yeah. employee to and get first. So if you bury them further in the site, you just have to have the knowledge that may or may not. See yeah, some a uh, one thought that I've had. I, uh, can I just yes, say go for it. I, I think it would almost be better, and, 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 and I don't know how you guys feel about this, but 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 so. taking all of those messages and just simply putting them on the page, I think I think the chances of an end user seeing that would yeah. be greater than burying it in a carousel. You know, well, that, that's interesting because then you have something like a page that basically. See, that's what I was just going to suggest. Something where maybe the home page has they would see it. You know, right. yeah. You know? yeah. Or something where the home page has just a call out, you know, a brief like snip of each little message with a call out. And then that brings you to an entire, like if you're talking ta in town for terms, like a pillars content page where right. they can really show that deep content. So the user still gets, you know, on the home page, just that brief little snip. Very, you know, not the whole message because the whole message is then on that page. It's one, it's another way to think about it. It depends again on client need. It depends on what kind of content, but. And again, this is still, you know, this is new to everyone. So as things evolve, as client needs evolve, as the web evolves, we may find different solutions. And that's, I'm really glad we're having this kind of discussion now. I, I think we also have to trust the end users a little bit more and give them a little bit more credit. You know, we can't be afraid that they're going to miss something. You know, we have to, you know, if our content is good enough and, and the message is important and it matters, then it's not going to matter. Uh, you know, they're, they're going to go, they're going to seek it out, you know. <clears throat> All right. So then getting back on track to the more technical side of things, how we handle responsive design in terms of styling is through media queries. So basically for both responsive and non-responsive sites, we have one CSS file, one set of, I guess, rules for how the browser should display a website. Notice I say should display a website because browsers sometimes do terrible things to sites even when we tell them not to. I'm speaking specifically to IE7 and IE8, which don't necessarily support newer styles. So they may not necessarily read all the rules we've set out and display the site exactly the way we want it. But for most modern browsers, you serve up the single CSS and it displays the site like that. For a responsive site, we have the single CSS, but we break down all of those different styles for all the different elements into sections of rules based on the width of the screen, the width and height of the screen and we separate them with these little at media blocks. So basically when we develop from a mobile first standpoint, so we'll look at how the site will look on mobile and we'll write out all the rules, you know, this paragraph will look like this, this image will be this size, etc. And then we say, you know, here, here's the first example, and this is going with from Nissan. So the four bottom modules will stack on top of each other on mobile or on small screens. So, shweep, down at the bottom, they stack on top of each other. Oh, this works. Then on the, uh, the larger, so on slightly larger screens, we have this media query. So this basically says when the screen is wider than 500 pixels, first look at these rules and then overwrite some of these rules with these new rules. So like, on the first set of rules, we had this margin, but now we have a new margin. So the new margin is going to write this, overwrite this rule. Any rules from mobile that aren't overwritten in the larger versions will still be there. So like if this had a border of, you know, two pixels wide, over here, it's still going to have a border of two pixels wide because I didn't tell it to do anything else when it got to a larger screen size. So that's, the, uh, that's the cascade and cascading style sheets. You know, yep. you have to think of it like that. You know, you have we start with our baseline styles, and and, and mobile has become so pervasive uh, over, over the last couple of years that we've actually kind of changed the way that we uh, um, uh, you know style up websites and, and, and create functionality. We we actually start with the mobile experience first, and then we use uh, we use media queries to enhance the experience. Uh, you know, as, 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 as a step was saying you know so we're very focused on how things are going we're more concerned right now about how things are going to play out on mobile than we are on desktop we'll get the de desktop is almost treated as a secondary now you know in, at least in our world <laughs> you know yeah. 
<clears throat> and as you see here, larger modules sitting about a quarter of the way, and they go to four across like that. So just something to keep in mind in terms of the technical stuff. It's really, really fascinating for me, and Spell might not be as exciting for you guys, but it's always good to keep in mind. So just a note on some navigation <coughs> patterns and different things you can do when playing around with navigation. The general kind of rule in terms of how navigation should be used, a lot of times we see the navigation at the top of the page. And actually, Nissan's a bad example because it keeps the navigation in the actual document at the top. But what we're seeing is from a development standpoint, the navigation should actually sit at the bottom. On the design, it should still be at the top of the page. We can use CSS to move it to the top. But in terms of the story of the website, it should actually be at the bottom with just a link at the top if you want to skip to the navigation. But the idea is to move the content as high up on the document as possible. And again, this goes back into search engine optimization. Yeah, Google, Google doesn't care as much about links anymore as it does about quality. Con I mean, links are still part of the algorithm, but it isn't anymore, you know, how many times can I link to myself and link through? That isn't Im as important as the quality of your content and having semantic content. So we want to bring that up and then have the navigation below in the document. From a design standpoint, that doesn't really change much, but it allows for some cool kind of patterns when we're looking at smaller screens and the way we can handle navigation. So this is a demo. This is a proof of concept that I did for a client. I've changed the logo to the RWD School of Rock. And what happens on mobile is you have the little menu button, which some call the hamburger button. And you just click it, and it slides it out to the side. It's kind of a Facebook style. And then once you get to a larger screen, it pops out and it stays there all the time. That's one way of handling navigation. A note on this in terms of the document, this actually sits on the bottom, but then I'm using a style when it gets to a larger screen that says basically, take this and pick it up and position it right, like absolutely at the top of this page. Uh, a quick note on absolute versus fixed positioning. A fixed position menu is something where, live editing, crazy stuff. No matter where you scroll, it's going to stay. Like notice this RWD School of Rock is sticking to the top. You want to avoid fixed positioning because when it comes to mobile devices, tablet devices, touchscreen devices, the browsers behind those can't necessarily always handle fixed positioning very well. So things might not look right when you're taking them onto a device. So the best result... And then, and then we want to avoid situations where we have to, uh, like let's say you guys want some sort of like fixed uh, heading at the top of the page. Uh, we don't want to get into situations where like, well, okay, well, you know, the iPhone supports fixed positioning, so just make it fixed on the iPhone and then just do, just do something for everyone else. We want to try to level yeah. the playing field and, and create a code base that works on, you know, equally well, you know, equally on, 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 on as many different devices as we, we could possibly get it on, you know? Yeah, and that goes back to what I was saying before last week about um, declaring, that way. Yeah, declaring device mm -hmm. independence, basically. Not worry, just worrying about sizes, not about specific devices. Also, another note, if you notice this is, this content modules, they are uh, expandables or like a, an accordion style on smaller screens. And then when they pop up, pop up here, they become tabs. Another cool little way you can play around with navigation. Also, um, I, I just want to note that the fixed settings sometimes um, uh, can be problematic when you're, you know, when you're with screen real estate. We want to try to, you know, you know, get as much in the screen as we possibly can. Even though there is no fold, we still want to strive to, you know, do that. So when you have something fixed and you get the content scrolling underneath it, you know, it's, it's, uh, you, you're effectively making the screen I think initially we had wanted to do that on, 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 on TV, but I think I was able to talk Jess out of it. <laughs> Another similar option, which Nissan has, is the slide out menu, <laughs> which is kind of the same. It just, instead of pushing all the content over, it just kind of sits on top of what's there, and then you know you can open it further from there. Another fun option is the jump link menu, which this site is actually an example. So you go up here, and this is your menu button, but instead of popping out a menu, what it actually is doing is an anchor link, and it's jumping you down to the bottom of the page where the navigation actually is. This is actually a nice design pattern from a user experience perspective, because if I'm a user and I've gone through this entire page, and I get to the end of the page, 
it kind of gives me an idea of, oh, where in the site can I go next? Where can I explore next? Whereas if you've got all your menu stuff, you know, at the top of the page, they get down to the bottom and, you know, it's the end of the page. Okay, maybe I'll go to a different site. So it just, it helps lead them through the rest of your content. It creates an explore. Yeah. And when we're talking about design and where to put navigation, we also have to think about ergonomics of use. So when we're talking, a lot of devices that we're going to be loading websites on, especially moving forward into the future, they're touch screens. So you want to think about where should I be putting my hit points so that someone holding their phone, you know, holding their phone in one hand on the subway, well, not on the subway because they don't have internet, but <laughs> holding their phone somewhere can easily reach over and tap and access those menus. And as you can see, you know, on phones, down by where your thumb would be as you're holding it, on tablets over here, and on laptops over here. And actually, my nav menu is probably not the best as an example of this because I'm actually putting my nav in where would be the hard place for someone if they were looking at this on a tablet to reach. So that's, you know, you want it, to, it's just something to keep in mind in terms of ergonomics of use. So when you say hard to reach, you mean the motion of going from here, then low, to the top? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Yes, but, you know, you think about you're holding a tablet in front of you. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like it's impossible and they can't pick their hand up and move their finger. But the idea is, again, as fast as possible, get them to what they want. And just to note, browse for inspiration. I don't have all the answers for all of the design problems of the world, but a lot of people are facing the same kind of design challenges you guys do every day. So whenever you're just, you know, looking at stuff on your phone, looking on your tablets, just know if you see something cool, if you see something you like. If you're ever doing a design and you go online and you see a cool pattern and you want to try it on a site, you know, email the developer you're working with and say, hey, is this something we can incorporate? You know, always open those discussions and share things because that'll really help us build up kind of a huge knowledge base of different kinds of things we can do. A quick note on accessibility. Now, accessibility isn't just something about responsive. It's something that applies to all sites, but it's something we should keep in mind no matter what, and I have your attention, so I'm going to talk about accessibility. Responsive design needs to respond to more than just a screen size. You have to think about different input types. Uh, someone could be using a finger, someone could be using a mouse, someone could be using a keyboard. And the difference between mouse and keyboard navigation can be really significant. So just to give a demo of uh, one form of ex uh, assistive technology, because I know we just talk about accessibility as kind of this broad, overarching thing with no real definition. So I want to show you an example of we want to code websites to be able to accommodate technologies such as this, which right. help people spell I something. I think most, I think, I think when the term accessibility comes up, most people tend to think, oh, it's for blind people and, and you know, handicapped folks and stuff like that. But essentially, the way we think about accessibility, we're thinking about how to make this content accessible to pretty much every single human being on the planet, regardless of, of any disability that they may have. How am I going to take this content and, and be able to share it on, 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 on our social network? Or, you know, is it going to be crawlable by search engines so people can find it? You know, so accessibility is just not it's just not not just for blind people. It's for it's really essentially for everyone. How's how's someone going to be able to access this on a um, you know a phone or a tablet? You know, so it's a it's a very broad term. <laughs> you know? So we just kind of wanted to share what yeah, uh, yeah, some the ones are broken. Right. Yes. Essentially, you know, we're trying to get, you know, uh, you know, um, candidates in for, for, you know, for our clients. And we want to make sure that we can get everybody in, you know, right. regardless of disability or, or device that they're using. It's the same for streets and pedestrian issues. Too, I yeah. Tell you, as a kid, people's issues. Yeah. yeah. All right. So this I just went through on Chrome browser. I used one Chrome extension and also voiceover utility, which is built into the Mac and just went through a couple different things I'd like to show. TD Ameritrade, link, skip navigation. So I'll stop right there. It said link, skip navigation. Nothing was highlighted, but there's a hidden link there so that if I'm tabbing through and I don't want to tab through all the navigation menu items to get to the actual content, I can click that and it'll jump me to the content. So that's an example of some of the hidden helper Visit text. Link. Search jobs or enter keywords, enter keywords, edit text, search jobs button, heading level two, contact and social navigation, list four items. That's another, it said contact and social navigation. You don't actually see that on the site, but I believe that's, did you add that spell or did I add that? 
uh, what does it say? It's the uh, the y, the WAI heading for this yeah, navigation there, uh, panel. Yeah, there's a heading there. Every list should have a heading in front of it to, to, to give that list context. So even though it's not in the design, we put it in there anyway. Yep. <clears throat> link. Returning applicants. Visited link. Contact us. So this is now going through. This would be an example for you know, a blind user, although accessibility as spell set applies to everything, but I've just taken out the actual screen portion. So you're just going to hear the audio of tabbing through a site and you should be able to guess which one. TMP Worldwide, LLC, navigation with eight items, home, like our work, blank list item, our expertise, blank list item, who, T, look, correct, connect, blank list, like, button, tweet, blank. This page has been shared 52 times. Yep. So now this is the same thing again, showing the visuals. And I wanted to note that as you were tabbing through, we got to all the main navigation and then we hit the social widget. So that's actually something, because I know TMP is up for a redesign, we will probably change in the future because the social widgets clearly aren't the main content on that page and should be, in terms of, from a document order standpoint, should be further down. So this is the same thing TMP again. TMP Worldwide, the... LLC. Navigation with eight items. Home, blank, our work, blank list item. Our expertise, blank list item. Who, T, look, correct, connect, blank list, like, button, tweet, blank. This page has been shared 52 times. Right, this is one to touch upon. Uh, tag clouds are used a lot. I don't like tag clouds that much, mostly because of using keyboard navigation and how frustrating they can be for a user. Job, Chicago, S, C, Digital, Develop, Agents, Flap, Google, Marketing. You can get through all of those to get down there. And finally, this is my favorite. I, with eight items. I stumbled Jobs upon this. Jobs at TMP, let RS, Facebook, RS, base, Twitter, RSS, base, RS, base, RS, base, RS, base, Twitter. So basically that, that Facebook, social widget tra traps you yeah. when you try to use it, and it won't let you tab through, which I didn't know until I tried it, and that's kind of fun. It, and by fun, I mean like terrible from an accessibility standpoint, but a good example for moving forward. And here are a couple of different technologies. Mac OS has voiceover utility built in, and there's a free download for Windows NVDA, which is a really powerful uh, screen reader tool. If you ever, if you've never done it before and you really want to just, it's, it's definitely a learning experience to just plug in your headphones and use only your keyboard as navigation using the screen reader and avoid using the mouse. iPhones have very nice accessibility features built in. Uh, cool. Yes. And now for the part everyone's been waiting for, the homework. Ooh. <laughs> um, before anyone, it's the basic is a responsive redesign exercise. Don't worry, we've already booked out time on all of you guys, so you're going to have actual time to do it. And we even have a job number. TMPW6496, so you guys are aware. And basically, this is going to allow you to collaborate with the development team in doing a responsive design. So we've randomly assigned you to work on one of five different client pages. I went through some existing talent groups and pulled out a couple different level one pages that I thought had some interesting content challenges. And basically, what I want you guys to do is just take the content and the branding and nothing else and do a full responsive redesign from a mobile from a mobile first perspective. So start with a mobile mock and then progressively enhance to a desktop mock. Uh, just to note, if you're currently working on a talent for refresh and you want would rather use those assets, that branding, because you're familiar with it, that's totally fine. But I still want you to start with the mobile perspective and then do a desktop layout that falls in line with that mobile first perspective. So the specs, the page must be fully responsive. Content must be structured in a way it can flow naturally on the screen. Again, focus only on the content features and branding. Ignore any existing layout. And also for the sake of this exercise, ignore any limitations that you know of the Talent Brew platform. Because I know Talent Brew has some kind of wonky rules to it. So for now, just design a responsive career site. Uh, design with a mobile first mindset, as I said, the final submission will include the mocks for a mobile version and a desk or a small screen rather and a large screen version. And during the design process, and this is important, I really want you guys to keep your workflow responsive. So in addition to a client, I have a spreadsheet worked out and 
all of you have a developer contact who is going to be available for the entire period that you have to do the assignment. So if you have any questions, if you have anything you want to bounce off them, you're welcome to email them, IM them, give them a call, whatever, and just ask those questions and work together. At the end of the assignment, that developer will then be providing notes for you guys on the designs. Uh, Mockup files, email the PSDs to me, uh, Stephanie Palmieri at tmp.com, by Tuesday, September 24th. You should provide one mobile and one desktop PSD file. And I did have a question from yesterday's session because I know some of the people on this training aren't necessarily, uh, don't do as much uh, work, I guess, with the actual creative development every day. But I just want you, to, if you aren't necessarily familiar with Photoshop or whatever, I just want you to take a crack at it with whatever tools you have available. Even if it's taking a piece of notebook paper and drawing a mobile site and then writing some notes about how it should function. Again, you know, ideally for the, the core designers, I'd like to see something at the level that you would present to a client. I understand there are limitations with time. Client emergencies happen. But I'd really like you guys to try and put as much effort as you can, as you can accommodate into this assignment. Because the ultimate goal of this is to get a sense of your experiences, to get a sense of working with mobile first so that we can figure out how we can kind of work this into the regular workflow of development at TM, design and development at TMP. Uh, yeah, as I said, the focus should be on content layout, navigation patterns, and usability, not pixel perfection. So after you submit your files, your front end contact will review your designs and provide you with some notes. The developers actually did a similar task like this a couple months back where we were given a mock up and we had to develop a responsive site and then we got notes back on our code. So we're kind of trying to do the same thing for you guys to give notes back on the design and how to make it more responsive and more mobile friendly. And again, this isn't about stifling creativity. It isn't about just being critical for criticism's sake. We really want to create a positive and constructive and open environment. So we're going to reconvene as a group during the first week of October. I haven't picked a set date yet. It depends on getting all the reviews done and getting all the mocks in. But we're going to bring in the developers and the designers, and we're all going to sit and kind of talk about the experience and figure out how we can use that to move forward. And I have the link here to the Google Doc, which has everyone's names and their assignments. And I will send that out along with this after the session. So I think we still have a little bit of time for questions, if anyone has any. So anyone in the room, anyone on the phone, questions about anything I've gone over today? Yeah, I, I have more of a, I have more of a comment for you guys. I was just wondering, uh, I, I can't get any love for uh, the off-screen menu uh, design that was from Bank of America that you guys showed up. <laughs> Who is this? <laughs> yes, you can. I, I wasn't. I was. Um, I wasn't sure if I was allowed to use the Bank of America logo. So. <laughs> no, it's fine. I'm just, I'm just giving you guys a hard time. Jake. <laughs> this is Jake. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, no, that's definitely, I think uh, Sean was the uh, producer on that, and he came to me and asked me to do a little proof of concept. So, yes, but that's definitely, it's a great navigation I'm, pattern. I'm glad. I'm glad to see. I'm glad to see it actually working, though, because it didn't get past the client, you know, with us. So it's 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 cool to see that it actually is is a is a functional uh, uh, layout that we could actually do. You'll oh see, yeah, you'll see it on uh, you'll see it on AT and T because we're using it there. That's going live in a couple weeks. Out of curiosity, what didn't the client like about it? Oh, that, it was it was um, well. They uh, first of all, it was just this just design issues with what they didn't like uh, once they got to the brand guy. Um, the functionality, uh, I don't think they had too much of an issue with. However, they uh, their reason for not wanting to do this uh, functionality-wise was they just got done having a vertical nav on the left side, and now they want horizontal navs at the top. So that was their reason. Okay, so it was more, it was an issue of they had their own corporate site, and you kind of had to make it jive with that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's 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 understandable. But I'm glad to know that you brought that up. And definitely, you know, if a client rejects something, for example, the entire Nissan career site, that doesn't <laughs> <laughs> that, that doesn't yeah, uh, for those of you guys who don't know, Nissan actually after we had finished the site, 
wanted to do a, they, they actually brought in an outside company to do an audit of the site, which somehow produced an entirely new site that then both the company that did the audit and we provided estimates on before Nissan decided to just bring the entire thing internally. So the Nissan site, which is probably from a teamwork standpoint, the most successful project that TMP has had to date in terms of responsive is will never actually go live because of I, the client. I, I promise we'll get a lot of good use out of this. You made some really interesting choices too uh, that I wanted to bring up with you in terms of what, what Digitas France did. I think it was a company that did the outside audit, um, i.e. red uh, circle with a unicorn and a sparkle inside of it in case you've never seen their logo. Um, interesting little logo. Um, but uh, they, they did this thing where they put all these uh, not modules, but, but boxes down below for things like uh, like the Nissan or whatever it is, instead mm -hmm. of having that uh, that nav up top, and they have something almost like a site map at the bottom of some of the pages, instead of um, where we normally could easily find a nav. And that that test was, I don't know if that comes out of trying to think responsive or what it what it is, but. You know, it was really confusing to us when we looked at it. Stephanie, did you see that? I haven't seen it. Yeah, I, I actually reviewed the mocks because I had to provide the estimation on it. And um, yeah, there was a lot. It wasn't designed as it wasn't designed responsibly, the redesign. Uh -huh. So, and I'm not even actually sure if they even ended up going with that with whatever they did with it. But point being, bringing all that up is don't ever stop pushing for these different ideas with every client or even with the same client, you know? always make the suggestions because that's even if they don't want it in the end at least get those ideas in their mind get them thinking plant the seeds and over time people will start to start thinking in a more responsive manner it's it's going to be slow i know clients can be incredibly stubborn but i spell laughs but mm -hmm. yeah thank you that was a really that brought up a good discussion anyone else out there I've got one more question in Chicago. All um, right. What I, I really I really liked uh, the that example that you guys have of the of the nav being at the bottom of the page. I think that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, are there other than the slide out and that example? Um, and I and I've also seen people use a drop down menu, just like your your simple uh, drop down menu bar. Is there any other things that you guys have seen for like how to, to uh, handle the nav on a, on a smaller yeah. screen. You know, Brent Frost has a, a really good um, uh, listing of... Uh, uh, oh yeah, I actually have, um, I think if it isn't in the presentation I sent out last week, I will send it again. But is it on his website? Oh, his um, list yeah, of responsive you know resources. Just go to Google and type in um, uh, navigation patterns, Brent Frost. Um, and he has a whole repository of, 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 of patterns. There we go. Yeah. So, and he gives you the pros and cons of, it, of using each one. So, if you guys go to this site, and we'll send out the link later. Yeah. Uh, I'll add that you one know, in. if you can get, you know, grab any good ideas from this uh, site. I, I this is I think he has two of them. There's one that's for like simple navigation, and there's one that's more for more complex navigation patterns. Where's <clears throat> the hide and cry? <laughs> Okay, yeah, I won't, I won't go into all the different ones now, but yes, this is a good resource. And again, as I said, all different sites, like I've, I'll stumble across stuff looking online. I'm just like, that's really cool. How'd they do that? So it's definitely something, keep your eyes open. There are, there's infinite possibilities. We may not have just found them all yet. Mm -hmm. And if you get a crazy idea in your head for a navigation and you want to run a bias, then by all means, go right ahead. <laughs> yeah, we like building stuff. Nothing is, uh, uh, you know, just... Sky's the limit there. Mobile shouldn't be looked at as like limiting. It should be looked at as a, simply a design challenge that we have to try to, you know, figure out. And, and uh, as, as long as we come at it with, with that spirit, I think we'll be, I think we'll be okay. <laughs> Thank you. We've got a couple more minutes if anyone has anything else they want to bring up. Experiences, questions. All right. All right. I'll give the last call. And with that, I will dismiss class for today. I'll send out the, uh, all of the follow-up links after this meet, after, you know, I get off the call. And again, thanks everyone. We'll convene after the design challenge. Again, any questions, email me, email spell. Thank you so much for coming guys. We really, really appreciate it.